Thank you, everybody. And thank you for joining us for this uh, panel discussion on stepping up outbreak surveillance in the age of pandemics. So I'm really excited today to have uh, three amazing scientists. They also happen to be friends, colleagues, and importantly, mentors of mine too. First up, we have uh, Padisa Betty. Padisa is a professor at Harvard University, the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She is an institute member of the Broad Institute and also an HHMI investigator. Padisa is an MD and is a computational biologist, and her labs work on many aspects of human disease, including infectious diseases and all kinds of other diseases, as well as uh, evolutionary biology. And Padis was also one of the 100 most influential people in 2015 by Time magazine. Also joining us from Nigeria, we have Christian Happy. Christian is a professor at Redeemers University in Nigeria, and he's the director of the African Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Diseases, ACEGID. Uh, his lab research is the genomics of infectious diseases, both on the host and the pathogen side. And importantly, Christian's lab has produced some of the very earliest data on very many viruses, whether that be Lassa, Ebola, SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV including sequencing and, and diagnostics. Together with Paris, Christian received in 2020, so last year, the Audacious Project uh, Award to establish uh, the program Sentinel, which is going to be a pandemic preemption system to detect and respond to viral threats in real time. And lastly, I also have Lauren Gardner uh, joining me. Lauren is an associate professor and co-director at the Center for System Science and Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. She is an engineer by training and she's one of the best data wranglers we have out there. And you might know her as the creator of the GHU COVID-19 dashboard. She has briefed US Congress on the COVID-19 pandemic many times and was also named one of the 100 most influential people of 2020 by um, time. Time Magazine. So with those introductions, let's dive straight in. So we are starting today, we are looking at a pandemic that is now under 100 million cases, about a quarter of those in the United States. Uh, out of those cases, we have two and a half million deaths so far, and this only over the last uh, year or so. So let me just start, you know, for, for the scientists here, we, like many others, have, of course, been deeply affected by the pandemic. So I want to start with a very simple question, which is, how are you? So maybe I'll start with Padis. How, how are you actually doing? Um, uh, well, thanks for asking, Christian. Um, today I'm doing okay, but we've all had a year of it. And um, it's it's been a hard year. It's been, I think, one of, one of the hardest. Um, but I think ultimately... The thing that motivates me every morning when I get up and wonder why we're doing this is for the, the folks that it's been not just um, hard, but almost unsurvivable. Um, the people who are trapped in their homes that are not safe, the people who are um, you know, thinking about their livelihoods. And so uh, kind of to get you know a little bit on this is we put them in a position they never should have been in because we weren't prepared. And so however hard uh, the days are, um, uh, we got to keep going because we have to do better. Christian, do you maybe have, uh, from the Nigerian perspective, you folks are certainly doing much better when it comes to to taming the pandemic here. Um, how how are things uh, with with you and and generally speaking in Nigeria? Well, things are things are things are okay. At least we um, started. I mean, I have a relief now that we have at least the first consignment of vaccine getting to Nigeria. At least we uh, were very worried because we got into a second wave here, where uh, we started having this new variant and started having increasing number of cases, but. I'm very hopeful with the vaccines and really my heart goes out for all of those uh, across the globe world really that uh, work very hard to stem this uh, pandemic and then also for the families of the afflicted and those who lost um, their, their, their dear ones. Okay. Lauren, your new mother too during the pandemic here. So so how are things uh, things with you? Yeah, thank, thanks for asking. Um, yeah, my 2021 is off to a very different start than my 2020. Wow. That's that's for sure. I uh, I think that I I lived in one bubble last year, working on this data collection and raising a baby dashboard, and then now I'm raising a baby human. And I think my sleep deprivation is about the same as it was last year at this level, but um, a little bit different in terms of the reward. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, but easing, easing out of maternity leave at the moment. So my brain is split in a couple different places. Right. 
So, so with that in mind, let, let's actually just take a sort of a, a look at where we stand today. Uh, and Christian just mentioned this uh, from Nigeria too. And I just wanted to look at, at some of these, these graphs. We're actually looking at the, the cases here and we're comparing Nigeria to, to, to the United States. And it looks kind of similar until we start ticking some boxes. For example, we can normalize the population and then we do constant y-axis. So what actually looked to be quite a similar picture looks extremely different when we're comparing like with like, and we're looking at cases here, but we can also look at the deaths during this COVID-19 pandemic. So I think this is pretty interesting. The United States was supposed to be the best prepared country when it came to pandemic, but the, but the numbers as of late would have, have told us otherwise. Why, why is that? And Christian, maybe we can start with you. Why do you think that we have been so terrible when it comes to, to pandemic preparedness and really really dealing with this pandemic? Well, I, I don't think that is a combination of so many factors, not only for Nigeria, but for Africa. I think, you know, the fact that Africans, you know, often manage to the epidemic at each point in time has somehow uh, prepared them despite you know uh, scarce resources they, they kind of um, uh, uh, tend to address this problem better without the resources that they have because they probably have built over the years some level of experience on and how to manage the situation you know a bit better than those that are not used to but then it could also be you know uh, some signatures you know arising from you know, other diseases or things that are not even relevant, and then probably prior exposure to different kind of uh, SARS coronaviruses on the continent. You know, it, it's it's a combination of many things. But I also think that what has helped Africa was a, is the fact that um, I think learning from the the, the COVID, I mean, the Ebola uh, outbreak in West Africa in 20, uh, 2014, 2016, the African government came out of it with a very hard lesson. And what they did was uh, immediately after that, they actually created the Africa CDC with a mandate of coordinating response, you know, especially to epidemic and pandemics in Africa. And that's really, that coordination is actually one of those things that Africa lacked before. And also harnessing the resources on the continent has been very helpful. And if you look at the way Africa responded, even during the first wave, all countries in Africa locked down almost at the same time because there was that coordination you know, I mean, uh, through the Africa CDC, and that was kind of very helpful. But also, um, Africa learned also from uh, the mistakes of the past and then started leveraging, you know, resources available, scarce resources available. For instance, you could see that centers like ours in Nigeria really were given the mandate to not only work for Nigeria, but for work, to work for other countries in Africa that do not have the resources that we have. And that really was very helpful because quickly we were able to identify what was going on in not only in Nigeria, but also in other African countries. And they were really using it through the Africa CDC as, you know, you know, using evidence-based evidence -based data in order to respond, you know, to the pandemic, both uh, nationally and then continentally. And I think because it brings up an important point, right, because if we look at the messaging, especially in the United States in, in 2020, uh, was was uh, the, the U.S. CDC did not have a very consistent message, and uh, the government, of course, and administration also didn't have a very well. It was very consistent, but it was ignore this thing. It's it's not a problem. That has, of course, changed recently, and we can see the U.S. CDC is starting to send out, you know, advisory and actually informing the public in a consistent language around this is something we're all in together. We need to we need to 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 fight this together. Um, I do, I, I don't know, Lauren and, and Padis, if you have, have, have insights on that too, that just as, about some of these differences between Africa, both overall being better at, at dealing with the pandemic, but I also think, is there additionally to that something about, you know, other circulating, other coronaviruses, for example, that might have given some immunity in the population, the population is younger, it's less obese, all these things that might also play factors in, in just the pandemic uh, being overall much, much lower in Africa. Yeah, um, I think like Christian was saying, I think there's a lot of factors. I think some of those are affecting maybe the low rates in Africa, but I really am convinced that it's a behavioral driven epidemic and we can look at a lot of the things about the viruses and their transmissibility but when it comes down to it i think that 
the places that did poorly, like the U.S., were, were did poorly because they weren't prepared. There was misinformation, confusion, misperceptions of risk, decentralized and misguided, you know, messaging, and not science driven policy. So I think all those things that Christian was saying they were doing right there from using past experiences and building on those and like guiding the public properly at a, you know, centralized level, we did all of those wrong. And you can see the, you know, outcome of that now. Yeah. And Christian, I kind of like, I actually, um, you know, uh, the, your original question, I had a question with, right? Your original question of like, weren't we supposed to be the best? Whoever said that, whoever thought that we were the best? I, I certainly didn't. And I don't think a lot of people uh, who work in this space ever ever thought we were. Uh, they could, you know, there were just many, many holes. It was, it was always clear that we didn't really have a coordinated global health system. Even during the Ebola outbreak, remember, right? It, like there was only one place in the country that could test for Ebola for months and months into the outbreak. And the first uh, Duncan, um, you know, in Texas, first patient in Texas, like we didn't have a plan in place and we didn't learn from the experience. We weren't really even, you know, so we weren't that prepared then and we didn't learn much uh, since. Um, and so the question now is, will we learn? And, and obviously the kind of the passing of a very major bill with a lot of room for science suggests that we might. Um, and so I, I think the science will move forward. The question is also, I think to Lauren and Christian's point, it has, it's both that, right? That we have to have a better pandemic preparedness system that's in place, uh, but then we also have to have trusts and ultimately vaccines, sorry, ultimately viruses um, uh, both expose and exploit cracks in our society and the trust that we built in our leadership and elsewhere. And I mean, and it really laid bare uh, where we are as a society here in the United States. And so um, it's, I, I think even with a great pandemic preparedness system, there's a lot of work we need to do and ground to, to work as, as a coordinated group, really feeling like in fellowship with each other to try to respond. Yeah, and I think that's some really good points there, right? Because I think the, the sort of the US is the best was based on a JHU uh, report from, you know, a number of years back. And those reports look at like the number of labs and the number of people. And it's true that on those metrics, the United States was doing, you know, was doing well. Um, but the problem is that over here, we were discussing a lot, should we even test for this disease? And that took us, you know, months of discussions and actually up to almost a year, right? And even, even arguing oh, how much we should test and where we should test. Christian, on, on your side in Nigeria, you had diagnostics and sequencing and everything set up um, way before the United States. And, and of course, our other colleagues in, in, in West Africa in particular, all were set up immediately. There was no discussion about you know, do we need to do this? The discussion was more about how are we going to do it best? And I think in the United States, I certainly think that we spend a lot of time on the part of like, do we even need to do this in the first place of which, of course, people in infectious disease research knew from the get go. Yeah, of course, we need to test for a virus. Of course, we need to take it, take it seriously. And just going back to Christian's point on this, the Africa CDC, I think the consistent messaging around what needs to be done, and you actually trust that people are making good decisions. Um, is really, really important. And again, I think that's certainly something that we and other countries have struggled a lot, a lot with. Um, so if we take based on that, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the importance of, of just data in general. So let me just uh, let me just show, you know, Lauren, um, you really early on back in January of, of 2020, together, I believe, with one of your, your graduate students, uh, created the JHU dashboard, which uh, we all got very accustomed to bubbles, uh, because there's this map full of bubbles, and it got scary and scary and scary, and it's, it's still pretty scary. Um, what's interesting, and this is obviously, this is literally used by, by billions of, 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 of different people and entities on a daily basis, our outbreak.info that I showed you is actually pulling data from here too. What I find interesting is that Lauren, it's it's you and a graduate student. How how can you do what, for example, the US CDC or the WHO or many other public health agencies uh, took six months or more to to develop? Why why is that? I find that extremely peculiar. Yeah, we we get asked that that question sometimes. Surprisingly, um, so it. I will clarify, it started with me and a graduate student 
what it is now is obviously something much bigger. But I do think it is a really important question. I think there's a lot, there's a, there's a few kind of core reasons behind why we were so successful with this. Um, one, I think speaks to the things we've been talking about just because of my background and area of research, I, I knew and recognized the value of this type of data from the earliest days and that it was important to understand what was going on in real time because you need to have that information to be able to make evidence-based decision-making. You need that so that science drives the policy. So if that information is not available, those th things can't happen. But also, and you know, there were situation reports coming out of WHO for instance. But the other thing is that data needs to be available in an accessible format, user-friendly format, and so that people can actually use it so that it's actionable. Um, and, and at levels, you know, we don't need to know that there was five cases in California. You need to know where in California those were. So all of those things, I think, are why it gained popularity so quickly. Um, another thing I think that contributed was that we were doing this in a very supportive environment. So I started this with my grad student and it was funded on my startup package from Hopkins for a little while, but we went, it grew exponentially really fast. I mean, a million hits in the first week. And so we needed more support and we basically got that overnight from Hopkins. Um, and so, and then later from philanthropies, but if we had to wait around to get funding from science agencies or the government, you know, this would not have been able to be continued because it got really demanding and expensive really fast. So there really needs to be these mechanisms to fund these things as soon as they need the funding um, so that they can continue. And then another is that it was technically a huge challenge, like it became one. And I was also really lucky to be in a position where we had a group of people with the skill sets required to be able to do it. Um, that could also just drop what they were doing and work on this fully, which is a huge ask. Um, but these were, you know, some of the best engineers and computer scientists and software developers. And um, a lot of these guys are working at the Applied Physics Lab at Hopkins, but we also had my engineering group. Um, and so I think that these are clearly really important disciplines that should be integrated into public health systems. And so we could do this with this team. Um, and then the other thing that I think we were in a position to do is we were a private institute that was doing this as kind of a, a public service. We could just make executive decisions and do things as we saw fit. Um, which was really necessary because it was an insanely messy environment. And we had the data was coming in from completely, you know, unstructured sources and the data was messy. And so we, you know, had, we propagated errors through everyone that's used our data knows it's messy and it still has problems because the data that exists is bad um, or, you know, messy and for lots of reasons, but one way or another, we just, did things and just would decide how to do things on a daily basis in a, this really evolving kind of space. And we didn't have to sit, we weren't in this bureaucratic environment where we had to sit and wait for approval to put things out because they, there might be errors in it. And it's not great to have something out there that was at that stage, you would like these things in production to have been tested a lot more you know, before they, we put them out there, but the alternative was to not do anything, which is what I think happened in a lot of other situations, um, which I think in that stage, something was better than nothing really early on. So, yeah, I, mean, and I, I think, think there's other things, but that's, that's the main pieces. So, yeah. And I think it brings up a, an, an, an interesting point, right? Because Christian and Padis, you guys have been pioneering sort of open data and the importance of sharing this data, um, not just among scientists or among scientists that are working in groups together, but with the public so everybody can access the data and, and, and actualize it immediately. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these things, it's, it's almost, you know, the, the JHU dashboard is an example of something that gets built up from the ground up in response to COVID-19. But looking at it, it's quite obvious that actually we need these things in place already, because if we're trying to start building them as a rapidly evolving mm -hmm. pandemic is spreading across the world, well, we're going to be, be behind that curve in, in general. So maybe like Paris and Christian, may, maybe the two of you like just thinking about what is the importance of data? Why is it actually that it's so important that we have this data so we can make better decisions? 
Christian, do you want to go first or do you want me to go? Or? Oh. Uh, go on, please. Okay. Well, Christian, you, Christian Anderson, you have to just tell us, tell us who to go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. um, but uh, I would, um, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, I think, um, yeah, what, um, I mean, Lauren's already shown us the testament of what, you know, data is useful for. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately what we talk about is just that outbreaks are a volatile situation in which every single person on the planet is at risk and involved. And, and you really do have to empower every actor in the system to be able to do what they need to do with, with this best information, right? It's, this is a war of us against a virus. And uh, the more situational awareness we have, the better off we all are. Um, and so I think ultimately, as, as Christian and I, and, and, and Christian Anderson was on the postdoc in my lab that when, when, all, when all the stuff that we did, um, you know, he was one of the leaders in this. So you were in this too, we were in this boat together. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I think when we did this, what we did during the Ebola outbreak, which is share our data openly, uh, pre-publication, which at that point was a big shock to do, it was with that in mind, right? That everybody needed to have the information uh, in real time as fast as possible. And I think for us, it was particularly, it was different because we, we, we were, Ebola came to our hospital. We were, had friends on the front lines. And so it wasn't an abstract idea of, oh, this is an opportunity for a publication. This is get help to our friends right now. And what would you do? What would be the fastest way you would get help, right? Is to share everything you've got and, and, and ask for the world to come and work with you on the problem. So I do think that that's the, you know, that is the real importance of it is, and I, th I think Lauren speaks to that too. It's also that importance of getting the right data and, and you want to get it out fast, but you want to get it out the right way. And um, there is the danger, like I, it was, I think during this outbreak, we might've been the ones that were slowest. Um, and it was actually because we like knew, we, like we, Chris, Jeremy Lubin called me about D614G in, in early February and was like, and I, and I was sort of like, we got to tell the world about these, like the, these, you know, we know the virus is mutating. We've published on it multiple times, but we need to tell the world. But he's like, no, hold. We don't want, you know, like it, it's this kind of thing of how fast do you move, but also move responsibly. And that's another challenge that you have, right? Where uh, you can also guide people in the wrong direction too. And so, so it's, it's a very interesting challenge of how to get the data out to everybody who needs it and to get it out in a way where, where it's, driving things in the wrong direction. And some of it we can decide and some of it we can't. I mean, uh, you know, I think ultimately sometimes we just say we release it and, and, and put in our caveats and that's the best we can do. We can't hold it much longer, but those have always been the, the dances that we're trying to do of how to get it out fast as possible, but responsibly. Yeah, I just wanna add too to that, that like in these particular situations, like in the US where we didn't have any guidance happening because there was no leadership really, that it data played an even more kind of critical role in some ways data being just available to the general public not just you know scientists so that people could just make their own decisions which is i think what happened right so yeah and i think it's 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 interesting because i think it it did, did happen and 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 i think Parisa's point about responsibly i do think is important because mm -hmm. i i think as of late i i think we we have seen some shortcuts taken especially around SARS-CoV-2 variants um, where the messaging has been less than optimal, right? Going straight from a scientist to, to the New York Times, for example, which is probably not very helpful because it, it confuses people more than it helps them make, make decisions. And I know, Christian, from, from your perspective, I mean, if we just go back to the idea of the importance of data here and Sentinel that, that you and Padisa are trying to establish, right, is, of course, an integral part of, of, of exactly that and, and how, how important data is but good data. Uh, if we're pretty sure that the data is wrong, it's probably not so good to, to, to have it shared as, as, as data out there. Um, so let me, let me just turn. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, yeah, I, I will say that, it, no, no, I just wanted to say that, you know, data has proven always and good data delivering time in an accurately has always proven to be very, very catalytic for uh, pandemic or disease outbreak response. I just really wanted to add to that. And then that's uh, that's going forward. That's the kind of thing that should be encouraged. Right. And Christian, can I just add one thing to something Lauren said, because it spoke to me? Um, you know, I, I really appreciate Lauren taking a moment and sort of saying, um, you know, how much of her success was also dependent on the support of the system. And I can tell you that, like, in my own life, my own successes have is, you know, as much as they are like on whatever, you know, 
what we do in our lives, it's actually dependent on the support I had in the system. When I have support, good things happen. And when I haven't had support, you're silenced and you're out. And I've had both uh, in pretty dramatic ways. Um, and, uh, and I would just sort of say, and I, I think a lot of people out there might have had both. Um, and, um, and I think that, I think that's just, a, it's just a really important point, um, of how, how, you know, like good on Johns Hopkins for being there for you and supporting you in that way. And, uh, and good on you for taking advantage of it, but also of acknowledging it. Um, it is, it is one of the biggest impediments that we have to success, right? There are so many people who, were there trying to do things um, and that uh, were met with a very different response. And I think, mm-hmm. I think that's just another thing that's important. Like I wrote a book called Outbreak Culture about the, that dysfunction that can exist with Laura Salahi, a journalist um, who you know, helped drive me into, into writing a story about this. But um, that's the other big critical thing, right? Is to our success is, is if we actually also do support each other in this. Yeah, and I think that that's a very important point because I think what you write about in Outbreak Culture, we have seen a lot of um, and during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's clear that collaborations are key to everything, right? And I think, uh, at least from my perspective and experience, is that the, the open data really ties that together. I remember, Paris, when we had the conversations around the Ebola genomes and we had with our collaborators, should, should we release them or not? Because again, this was new at the time. And I remember that conversation took, what, 10 seconds, maybe 20 yeah. Um, that of course we should do that. And, and it was remarkable that by doing that, people saw the data, people started analyzing the data, reached out to us and saying, oh, have you thought about this? Have you actually looked at this over here? And ended up being extremely collaborative. And, and that is certainly occurring in, in, in COVID-19 too, research in general. And we have seen a lot of very, very good collaborative research, but that's not to say that all of it is though. Um, there's, there's still some of that, some of that outbreak culture um, in there for sure. I love uh, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let me just go back to because, but you mentioned D614G, um, which is uh, one of these first, uh, well, the first variant of of, um, of SARS-CoV-2, and I just wanted to to zone in on on uh, on, on B117, which is this you know variant first identified in in the UK, of course. Um, it's got a bunch of mutations, as we can see up here, especially in the spike protein, but otherwise too. And if we just look at its rise in prevalence, this is in the United Kingdom, where sort of November is when it starts ticking up. And within just a couple of months, it's basically everything there is there. Um, and if you look at the United States, messier data, because we don't have as good genomic data sets, but we can see this similar increase in, in a country like that. And let me, let me ask you a simple question first, which is that I, are you surprised to, to see something like this, this happening, for example? Like, are you surprised that, so what we, let me add a little bit more. So we know that this lineage is inherently more transmissible, right? Yeah. And that's, that is actually why we see this increase in frequencies over time. Is that something we should have expected or is that surprising to see? No, that's, I mean, it's very expected. I mean, I, you know, that the, you, you know this well, <laughs> that our distra- detractors scandalized us and, and, and uh, berated us into silence about the fact that this is a, uh, obvious that's how natural selection works we're evolutionary biologists we know that um it is it is like kind of there are two things can be true that most mutations will have no biological effect um but at the same time uh if it you know a a very rare thing that's plausible it becomes very likely if you give it enough chances and millions and millions of human transmissions um is a lot of chances for that rare event to happen and um so no, we've seen it again in many, many viruses before. We saw it in SARS. We saw it in Ebola. We, you know, we published on that. We, you know, published that um, we saw that right as the Ebola outbreak, just at the inflection point when the outbreak got out of control. Multiple mutations just came came in and swept over just like that, and they all happened to be in um, Ebola's glycoprotein, which is much like corona, you know, COVID's spike protein, is what's interacting with our human immune system and is likely what's, you know, uh, getting into cells and what would make sense. So um, no, this is, this was obvious, um, but uh, to a lot of people, I think there's like the two sides of it, right? There's the um, Ebola is going to go airborne tomorrow versus Ebola is never going to change. And people couldn't see between that and say, no, like it's neither going to like suddenly completely change as a virus, nor is it going to stay stagnant forever. It's going to move. It's a moving target. And so you have to be on top of that moving target. It's not, you know, the, I, I have to tell people when I talk about coronaviruses, I'm like, cause I'm always talking to young kids who are like, what do I care? You know, like, it's not my problem kind of thing. And I mean, 
not, you know, I love them, but also some, some of them are a little bit dismissive of it. And I, and I was just like, Hey, you wait a hot minute and it will actually also be fatal to you. So like, that's what viruses are doing. Like don't ever rest on your laurels. Um, and you should do it obviously for your fellow man, but you never know where this virus is going to go. Um, and so you have to move quickly. Yeah, and I think, uh, Christian, I don't know from, from your perspective, because you have been doing a lot of genomic sequencing in, in Nigeria, for example, and, and have also noticed some of the, not the, the, well, the B117 variant, which, which you're tracking as well. And I believe your lab was the first one to detect that and have a number of those now. But you are doing genomic surveillance, right, to actually keep, keep track on that. And is that something, again, you had to establish because of the pandemic, or was this actually something that was, that was already there? Uh, well, I, I do think that it was already there. I mean, we didn't establish this because of the pandemic. I think it's just something that we've started uh, doing way back as far back as 2014, 2013, 2014. And I, I do think that it's, uh, it has shown now and than ever that is a very powerful tool, you know, to not, I mean, to be on top of a very rare, what I call a, a, a event that, that could be very crucial to say, you know, to save mankind. I mean, if we don't do genomic surveillance, then we end up having bigger problems to resolve. And, and, and that, that's the reason why this whole sentinel programs really becomes very crucial. You know, it should be at the heart of any, everything that we're doing going forward, because look, if if we had a system of that may I mean like that established already, and we probably will not be dealing with such a big problem that we have right now. I think you know genomic surveillance really uh, is not just very important, you know, for I mean for public health, but 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 generally it's really at the heart of what I call you know to to save I mean to save mankind because look whether we like it or not, you know we have the interaction between mankind and nature, and then we really do not know what is out there. And we really do not know uh, what 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 is next, and then therefore we should really be prepared. And then this is one of those ways where we can actually start getting prepared, and then to avoid. Right. Yeah. And I think the, the again the the importance here has has certainly shown itself. And you should you know the reason why these variants got detected in the first place is South Africa having a surveillance system in place and noticing this rapid displacement of lineages and then alerting their UK colleagues and saying, do you see anything similar and realizing that actually they did. And of course, we then learned about it in, in, in Brazil. After that, they're all different variants, uh, but but they're showing similar similar things, which is this rapid spread through through populations. And but it's to your point about should we be surprised, I totally agree with you that we, we, we shouldn't. But the problem is then that if we then look at, OK, now we know these more transmissible variants are there. Are we actually acting on that information? Um, and Laura, you, Lauren, you're right now in, in Texas, for example. Texas, you know, last week it decided that they were done with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, uh, even though the COVID-19 pandemic is probably not done with Texas, unfortunately. Um, and it's interesting because Texas is one of those places that we know is we see a rapid increase of B117 and it's, it's growing in frequency there. And the question is that, you know, why is it that we don't take that information and say, actually, we know that we are facing something that's more transmissible. We know that because of that, we should expect an increase in the number of cases, even if we didn't do anything differently. But what we're doing differently is the opposite of what we need to do. You know, no more mask mandates and opening everything up to 100% capacity, for example is that I have been sort of, it's peculiar to me that we continue to do this where we, where we don't act on information we already have, but wait until it's a big problem and then we just react to it, right? Which is typically why lockdowns, for example. So what is the, like, again, the importance of data feeding into all of that? And, and what is it really that, that makes us here so uniquely bad at reacting on data we already have, for example? I don't know, Lauren, maybe you, yeah. you, you, you have a few, just because you fi find yourself in Texas right now. Yeah, just because I'm here. <laughs> um, well, no, Texas is a perfect example of it. I think the one of the biggest issues that I've been concerned with the whole time is just the fact that this public health crisis has been so politicized. And I think that that's the reason that our decision making is 
or part of the reason that our decision making is so bad. And the U.S. is complicated in general. Our politics have been even more complicated the last few years. And, you know, then you have country versus state versus counties. Um, and Texas is a great example of, you know, I'm in Austin right now. Like Austin's not Texas. Like Austin is, you know, does not approve of any of these decision making um, that's coming from the state and Houston was the same. Uh, and so I just think in general, I'm just really frustrated this whole year with how these inappropriate drivers are affecting our, our decision making. So I think, you know, some people would like it to follow the science, but there's been this kind of anti-science mindset happening amongst, unfortunately, the people that were making decisions. And that's why I think these things weren't acted on the way they should. I'm hopeful they will be. And they're start, it's starting to look like we might be making decisions at a national level um, a little bit more appropriate. But I don't, you know, expect anything else from Texas, really. It's, uh, you know, open up, don't take our guns and let us not wear masks and go to bars and do whatever we want. Right. Mentality. Yeah, and I think Face masks are interesting, right? Because they are some of the most effective tools we have, right? And it's actually relatively easy. I mean, you just put it on and you're done. Um, and, and, and again, but, but it comes to the question of, of because I, I think as we look through this and live through this, the, the big question is that, well, we actually, are we learning, right? Are we doing better now than we did in the beginning? I think we can all agree on that. Yet, yes, things are going better now and we're making better decisions, but there's also a long way to go, I think. And the question is, Will we actually, when COVID 2026 comes around, for example, will a place like the United States actually do better? I'm sure Nigeria will, and I'm sure that many of, 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 of countries in, in Africa in general, as well as many other places in the world, are better prepared. But are we actually better prepared and are we learning for the kind of mistakes that we're doing during this particular pandemic? Christian, maybe you have a, 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 some, some viewpoints on that. Is the United States learning? Yeah, I, I do think that the United States will learn. I think we, I mean, for instance, you have a new administration, but I think looking back when the total case fatality or when the total number of death will be announced, after this pandemic, I think that will ring a bell in the ears of people because it's not just easy to talk about 600,000, 1 million people dead. I mean, it's, I mean, in the long run, people will be remembering one or two people. Uh, I mean, they will know someone that knows someone that knows someone that died. And I think in the long run, I, I mean, it, some lessons will be learned. Probably not like orders, but I think there will be some progress because just just it's, it's, it's a terrible number of death in this case, and and I'm sure that you know for this generation or everybody that has witnessed this, it might not just be easy. And I think the, the things are going to be different. Definitely, I, I I strongly believe that. I think the pessimistic view of that. I think unfortunately there may be some changes, but I don't think it's going to be because of the death toll. I think it's going to be because of the economic cost here that that's what people are going to remember. And that is what they're not going to be willing to accept again. So if they invest in public health, it's going to be because they don't want to have to shut down the country again, not necessarily because they don't want to lose citizens, but. I yeah. And I think that's, that's an because it, especially in the beginning, sort of that it was either save the economy or save people, right? But actually, mm -hmm. you need to save people to save the economy, right? It's the, it's the same thing. It's the virus, right? You need to fight the virus so you can save everything, right? And 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 I think I'm hopeful that I think that those sort of lessons will be learned because it's very clear in the data now that that countries that did really well when it came to controlling the COVID-19 pandemic from an economics perspective, you know, only looking at economy, doing way better. Right. And I think those data sets are very, very, very clear by now. They're messy in the beginning and you could sort of pick it up and figure out whatever, you know, make it fit whatever you want it. But it's very clear that, that it's not one or the other. It's, it's, it's both. And just a question too, because when we look to the outbreaks in general, um, it might feel that outbreaks are more prevalent these days. And the big question is, are they actually more prevalent? And if they are, what is it that's driving them? things like the COVID-19 pandemics, but also, for example, frequent uh, Ebola outbreaks and epidemics that we are seeing uh, in, in recent years. 
Is it just because of the news or, or, or are, are outbreaks actually more more frequent these days? Paris, maybe you, you have some thoughts on that. Well, you, you know, we co-authored co a paper together, actually with Christian, <laughs> um, uh, back in 2012 um, that posed the question, emerging disease or diagnosis, uh, question mark, it was a question. It was basically asking whether or not all these threats that we think are new and emergent and scary are truly emerging or is this emergent detection of things that are long been circulating. And we, we framed that, that paper around Ebola and Lassa virus and, and the paper had a picture of Ebola drawn into the Congo River as a, we think it's circulating more widely than other people know. Uh, and then two years later, we were in the midst of a big outbreak. Um, uh, after finding that it was indeed circulating in other parts of Africa we didn't know. And ultimately, if we're not looking for things, we're not gonna see them and we don't really have a sense of it. So yeah, we don't really have a sense of death tolls for most infectious diseases uh, up until now and still today, right? When, when was the last time you went to the doctor? When, when's the last time you got sick and you, um, you know, found out what you had if it wasn't COVID, right? If it, like that was the one thing we're testing for, but um, we don't normally test for things. We don't know what's going on. And so ultimately um, I think a lot of it is just knowledge base um, that the more we look, the more we'll see. Um, and, you know, a lot of these insights came from working with Christian Happy in Nigeria on, on Lassa virus and, and seeing how many cases just were going undetected and how most infections, you know, this whole idea of an asymptomatic infection, we know that we've seen those in other, uh, in even asymptomatic spread, we've seen that in other viruses. Uh, you're going to find that a lot of viruses circulate that way. Um, and the more we look, the more we'll see. So that's all to be, you know, to be, tr is, is the case. And I think that the, if we can create better systems of just doing routine diagnostics, we'll be better informed. Um, and then that all said, I, I, there is, there is uh, you know, possibly an escalation also on top of that. Uh, you know, so I'm not saying that that's not also happening. Um, and you know, I, uh, I'll, I don't know if I want to take your viewers and take them down this journey with me, but um, I certainly do think that we need to be concerned about this being, um, this is not, we're not one and done. This isn't a behind us, this will happen again. And I do believe that if it's not um, natural that, that we are gonna have to uh, face man-made or man-spread viruses too. And I think we need to take that really seriously. If I was a bioterrorist right now, I would, or a terrorist right now, I would, I would look and say, this is a good way to tank an economy. And, um, and we're putting out a lot of information out there, data that can be used both ways. We have to be honest about that too. Data about what, you know, where people are vulnerable, how viruses spread, what it makes them more transmissible. Um, all of that is to say that in the next five or 10 years, um, we may be facing with a different kind of, uh, different kinds of threats uh, where the index case does not wanna be found um, and is not on our side. Uh, and so uh, it just tells us that we have to be very, 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 very vigilant for multiple reasons. Right. Yeah, and I think that the importance of sort of detection systems in general, right? The importance of diagnostics, the importance of being able to have easy access to that. I mean, in this country, it's still extremely difficult to get a COVID-19 test. This is something I should be able to make that decision at 6 a.m. in the morning, and then at 7 a.m. I can do my own test at home. It already exists. The technologies are there, right? But we, of course, we need to we, we need to distribute and we need to actually make them accessible. So we just have a couple of minutes left here. So let me just, uh, the, the last question here with, with input from all of you, and we'll start with Lauren, is that uh, we, if we have this panel next year at the same time, where, where are we going to be? How is all of this actually going to look like? Are we back to normal? Are we still sitting at home? Or, or where are we? So Lauren, mm. let's let's start with you. Well, I already said I think this is this virus spread is such a behavioral, you know, so behavioral based. So I think it could go really two different ways. Like best case scenario, things are looking pretty normal, and maybe we have a COVID booster as part of our annual flu vaccination process or something um, to keep it at bay, and we've got transmission down globally. Um, because we did a good job actually distributing vaccines more fairly and all over the world. Um, on the other hand, if we don't do that, then maybe we get it under control in the U.S. temporarily, but it spreads somewhere else and there's, you know, new variants and they come in and we're playing whack-a-mole a year from now with COVID hotspots all over the place, you know, in the U.S., like what happens with measles or, or worse in other places in the world as well. So, um, I think there's just, there's a lot of factors still at play that we need to do right to, to know. Christian, what's your, what's your view on that? Uh, 
my view is that you know if we do not if we do not take this holistically and then take it as a global problem, we may have this pro we may still be battling this issue next year because thinking that you know would have solved the problem in some countries with vaccines and why others are still battling, you know, uh, the, this pandemic will really create a situation whereby nobody is you not know, going to be saved by next year. I think the idea should be to go out there, let's you let's go in holistically. And then ensure that the, I mean the global everybody in the world is actually safe, and everybody in the world will receive probably a vaccine that can protect us. Right, and Paris. Yeah, I mean I think those are great. Obviously, I, I told you where things could go. <laughs> I, I think I've said enough, um, but uh, but I, I agree with everybody that we we have to stay absolutely vigilant in all this. Right. Yeah, and just from the last, uh, because I, I totally agree with that, I will say from my perspective, I am actually quite hopeful because we do have really effective vaccines. But I think the key lesson here is that it's up to us, right? We decide whether we want to be, you know, dealing with this next year or whether we actually want to get control on this. And on Christian's point about being holistic about it, being smart about it, doing what's necessary, this can be much, 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 much more manageable, I think, just over summer here and then stay that way. But the problem is that that success is not guaranteed, right? It's not just something that happens by itself. It won't happen automatically. It really is, is up to us to do that. So with that, I just wanted to thank all of you for joining me here. This was amazing. And I hope everybody will have a good summer and things will be more, more back to normal. And, uh, and thank you again for joining me. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.